A new gambit was invented in chess by none other than an unknown 1600 rated player, who did that by accident, however it turned out to be a pretty cool thing. This gambit works against the Sicilian defense, one of the main lines played by Black, and is being played by Kasparov, Fischer and many other famous players, and at this point White plays Queen takes d4. That is not a novelty yet, Black goes knight c6, trying to gain a tempo, attacking the Queen, and the main move here is bishop b5, which leads to a well-known theoretical variation. However, White goes Queen a4, and he establishes this pin on the knight. Therefore, black naturally wants to neutralize it, also maybe white wants to bring the bishop out and increase the pressure, therefore black goes bishop d7. Now, so far it's been more or less standard, nothing really special. However, at this point, in 2017, a 1600 rated player from Poland, Straszewski, played queen to b5, which turned out to be a beginning of a pretty cool and very tricky idea. Now, just to set the stage, at this point it's nearly impossible to invent a new chess opening from millions and millions of games that were played. It's virtually impossible to play anything new within the first boost, and grandmasters usually end up coming up with some relatively new idea on move 15, which doesn't really change the situation dramatically. Anyways, now, queen b5 is a strange novelty because it violates all classical opening rules such as don't move the same piece twice in an opening. In this case, white actually moves it three times in a row. And the second rule is do not use those early queen attacks, such as, you know, the scholar's checkmate attempt. It's considered to be a bad beginner's idea because your opponent is supposed to attack this exposed queen, gain temples and rush into their own counterattack, which is supposed to be really dangerous for you. Therefore, queen b5 certainly violates everything, but somehow in this particular exceptional case, turns out to be not such a bad thing. Now, queen b5 pursues a very direct idea to just grab this pawn on b7. And of course, there are a number of ways that black may try to refute that. The most straightforward way would be to play knight to d4, which is a discover attack of the queen as well as the double attack of the queen. From here, the knight also hits this pawn on c2 as well as the knight on f3, and that already looks like the most straightforward refutation. For instance, if white were to capture this pawn on b7, black would happily grab this pawn on c2, win the rook, and that would be a very normal chess game of beginners. However, white has prepared a nice surprise. Instead of queen takes b7, white leaves the queen undefended right here, and instead just grabs the knight on d4. It turns out that after this trade on b5, white comes out with this check, and there is no way for black to cover the king other than sacrificing their own queen, which will result in white having one extra piece in an endgame. We've got three minor pieces versus two minor pieces of black, and that is the first trick of this gambit. With that being said, the most played move by black here is just an attempt to guard this pawn on b7 by playing queen to c7. Again, looks like a very standard Sicilian defense move, and it protects this pawn. To this, white replies with knight to c3, kind of just developing pieces, and now black can play a6, hoping for the queen to come back. Now, another weird thing is that the move a6, which is really the most common move in the Sicilian defense for black. Black plays it in pretty much every variation of the Sicilian defense. In this case, it also hits the queen, kind of pushing it back. Looks like there can be just nothing wrong with this move pawn a6. However, it turns out to be a losing mistake. Again, there is no explanation to why this gambit is so successful, I cannot comprehend it myself, but somehow it works. a6 is already a losing error by black. What do you think about this? It's crazy. And the refutation is knight to d5, where it does not drop the queen back. Instead, they counter black's queen. Now, what can black do? They can't accept this queen trade because it's not just a trade. As a result of this line, what would fork the king and rook, therefore winning this rook on a8 for nothing. Black can't go there. But what else can they do? Then, well, it means that they need to move the queen back. Plus, they still wish to guard this pawn on b7. Therefore, they usually play queen c8, sometimes queen b8, but it doesn't really matter, because in both cases, instead of moving your queen back, you now can infiltrate to this b6 square, which is no longer guarded by the pawn or the queen. You go queen to b6, and it creates an unstoppable threat of knight to c7, forking the king and rook. Therefore, at the very least, you will force their king to move, and therefore expose it, plus you'll win that rook in the corner, which gives you a winning position. I mean, very simple, straightforward, but there is nothing that black can do against it. Moreover, if they don't react properly, and let's say play something like knight f6, like they're actually getting in a big trouble now. 
because now after a knight to c7 check, the king must move, and now not only white wins the rook, but they keep checking black. Therefore, the king has to move, and white has this weird windmill attack where black has to keep moving the king back and forth, and white can keep erasing material with more and more discover checks, and white can just repeat this operation however many times they want to, and ultimately, I mean, white can just now develop at some point, like let's say play something like bishop d3, and notice that we remove this rook and this pawn from the game with nothing else changed, and we are we keep attacking actually. So that's another pretty cool way to fool black and to win the game on the spot. Now we know that the most played move by black, pawn a6, turns out to be a losing error due to spectacular knight to d5 counterattack. What else can your opponent try? Instead of a6, they may try a knight to d4 right here. Notice that there is a difference. Previously we analyzed that this move did not work when black had their queen back there on its original square. However, now knight to d4 seems like a perfectly fine move, again opening up this discovered attack, threatening the c2 pawn the knight, looks like it should be good for black. And there are different ways to go about this, you could just drop your queen back and in fact you have an equal normal position. However, the move that I like even more is to actually sacrifice the queen once again, bamboozling your opponent yet again. Now you accept this kind of, you know, weird variation where you sacrifice a queen for two minor pieces. However, now their king must move, there's no way for them to cover it, so they have to centralize and expose their king. After this, you continue with knight to d5, threatening queen yet again. And we have this unusual situation where technically you're down material, you've got two minor pieces for the queen, and ideally you'd love to have one more minor piece to keep it balanced. However, their king is exposed, so is their queen, and you are already attacking them with your minor pieces which are so well placed and attack a lot of squares all around the board. Therefore, it's very hard for black to come up with the right moves. Now Stockfish says that the position is equal, which means that black has some way to defend it, but it's super tricky. Now, the most natural response of your opponent to this queen attack would be queen a5, because all these squares, you know, are taken by your minor pieces, therefore queen a5 check looks like a natural solution. However, this loses the game straight away. After bishop to d2, it turns out that now the queen is just trapped, has nowhere to go, like all these squares are taken by your minor pieces, therefore they'll have to give up a queen for one of your minor pieces, let's say a bishop, and now once again you're just up a minor piece in a simple endgame position. Another tempting but incorrect try of black is to move the queen to c5. From here it hits this knight on d4 and looks like now you're kinda in trouble, like your pieces are a little bit shaky, but you respond with bishop to e3, setting up this discovered attack on their queen on the next move. You can jump with your knight to c6, checking their king, and then grab their queen on c5, which will probably mean that they have to move the queen back to c8 from here, which would just be a waste of time. Therefore, we just come up with a conclusion that the only correct move for black, which is very hard to detect by your opponents, is the passive move queen to c8, just trying not to lose their queen. Now, to this respond with another subtle move, bishop d2. And I'm adding two exclamation marks to this move because it's really beautiful. Now, such a subtle move, just moving your bishop one square, which looks like a developing move, in fact creates a deadly threat of bishop a5 check, which your opponent can easily overlook, just thinking that you're developing a bishop. But even if your opponent notices the threat, there is no normal way to stop it. Because if they try b6 at any point, that is a losing mistake, because that weakens this square on c6. And now you can barge into their territory, check their king, and that wins the game. It can go here because of your other knight. If it goes to any of these two squares, you can come up with this discover check and grab their queen on the next move, again ending up with an extra piece and a pawn in an endgame. If your opponent does not try to stop bishop a5, but just plays any developing move such as knight to f6, then, well, you carry out your threat bishop a5, and that is nearly a checkmate. Like, they'll have to play b6 right here, and now you could go knight c6, as we discussed before, that would also win the game, but even more straightforward is just to play knight takes b6. And again, something totally crazy happens here. You are utilizing your two bishops to almost checkmate your opponent's king like early in an opening stage, like that's something crazy. They'll have to cover by the queen because there is no other legal move possible. And then let's say if, as you trade it off, you, you're just ending up with two extra pawns in an endgame. 
and basically your plan will be very simple to push these pawns forward at some point. I mean, perhaps you need to guard this one first, play some flag f3 and maybe castle, but down the line you're, you're going to push your past pawns and hopefully win the game. I mean, it's technically winning. Now, I understand that you guys at this point write me in comments that like it is just two extra pawns, it does not guarantee a win, like it's easy for white to spoil it later. I understand it, but that's just the subject of another discussion. If you want to know how to convert winning advantages, how to play end games properly, I've got a free masterclass that you can check out by clicking the link below the video in the description where I go over those subjects so that you can get those wins which you deserve to get. All right, we keep exploring this weird gambit, which as far as I know has no name, therefore you're welcome to suggest your ideas in comments how to call this crazy gambit idea where you voluntarily expose your queen, making it vulnerable to all kinds of attacks that magically all fail in different ways. And by the way, the other attempt of black to make use of this exposed queen is to try the knight to e5 move, another fairly common reaction of your opponents, still trying to make use of this discovered attack and threaten your knight on f3. And yes, you guessed it right, we're going to sacrifice our queen yet again, as we always do in this line. You're playing knight takes e5 here, letting them capture the queen. By the way, another cool thing is that you could still play knight d5 with that counter strike, that would also be pretty cool, but knight to e5 is even better. You allow this uh, sacrifice of the queen, and now you check their king, it has to move, and this way you win the other way. Now you've got knight takes f7 fork. You keep chasing their king, the king has to move, and now after a knight takes h8, you end up with material advantage this time, plus you keep attacking and you just destroy their position, this king and queen are still exposed, and you have lead in development, everything's good, I mean it should be easily winning. Since all kinds of attempts to make use of your vulnerable queen failed for black, what if they just try to develop and play knight of 6? Well, there is still one last trick that you can try. In this case, you can try queen to c4 move, which kind of feels like you were just worried that black would play e6, b5, all that stuff and will chase your queen away, so you just want to drop your queen back to safety. And in this position, the most played move by black is a6, they still wish to play b5 and keep chasing your queen back, however a6 turns out to be a losing error once again. You come up with knight to d5, and now black is sort of in trouble. Now, of course, they could theoretically move the queen back, which would be a better try, but in reality, they usually take here on d5, overlooking the fact that after you recapture, now this knight is attacked, but it can't go away because of the pin, which means that on the next move, you're going to win their knight and win the game. The last try, they can b5, counter strike in the queen, but you can just keep the queen along this file and their idea fails, they're still suffering this pin, and on the next move you will inevitably win the piece and the game. It's also worth mentioning that if your opponent responds to queen b5 not by moving their queen, but by using their rook to guard this pawn on b7, that doesn't change the situation too much. Rook on b8 is passive, it doesn't do much besides guarding this pawn, you still play the same move knight c3, and now from here there is a choice. If your opponent plays pawn a6, then yeah, here you don't have that trick that we talked about before, you don't have knight d5 hitting their queen on c7 because there is no queen there. Therefore after a6 you'll have to just retreat with your queen, but the nice thing about this whole gambit is that you don't compromise your position. Therefore, even if your opponent doesn't fall for any of your tricks, you end up with an equal normal chess position and you just keep playing chess. If instead your opponent here tries knight d4, which is a much more tempting idea by black trying to refute your idea and punish you for this you know, provocative attempt in an opening, then it fails to the same tactics that we already know. You still sacrifice your queen and after this trade, the only thing they can do to cover their king would be to play queen d7, which means that as a result of this trade, they'll be down a piece in an endgame. Also, I gotta mention that you won't always get this exact variation, because as you enter the Sicilian defense, some of your pawns will play d6, it's very popular, which black aims to get to the knight of variation, or the dragon variation, or the classical variation, and whatnot, but they can also play knight c6, which is equally popular, and in this case, your gambit does not work, it's just another thing. Now, what do you do here? I recommend another shocking variation, the move pawn to b4, which again looks completely out of this world, but it's a very interesting idea. I've got another video where I show you how Magnus Carlsen used our dirty trick to defeat another GM in just 11 moves and you can check it out right here. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want to level up your positional chess overall and know how to convert your advantages into a win, check out the free masterclass by clicking the link up there.